new world. Um, and it's also an opportunity to, I think, for the Martians to, to rethink how they want civilization to be. So you can maybe rethink like, what kind of form of government do you want, what new rules do you want to have. Um, there's a lot of freedom and opportunity on Mars to do a recompile on civilization, which will be up to the Martians. So, all right, let's get it done. Elon Musk often describes Mars as the future home of humanity, the next great frontier. But what if I told you that Mars is actually a hostile world that wants nothing more than to kill you? Let me tell you about the deadly secrets the Red Planet is hiding. When we finally set foot on the surface of Mars, one of the first things we will notice is the difference in gravity. Mars has only 38% of Earth's gravity. At first, this might seem exciting, especially if you've read science fiction novels like A Princess of Mars, where the hero can leap great distances and battle Martian creatures with ease. However, the reality is more complicated. We already know that extended stays in microgravity, like aboard the International Space Station, can cause serious health problems, including muscle loss and bone demineralization. While it is not yet known whether Martian gravity will have similar effects, it is a valid concern for long-term human missions. Another major challenge is radiation. Mars lacks a global magnetic field, so its surface is exposed to solar particle events and cosmic rays. In addition, the planet's thin atmosphere does not effectively filter ultraviolet radiation, which can break down molecular bonds. For example, ammonia, NH3, is unstable in the Martian atmosphere and degrades within hours. The thin atmosphere also means that temperature swings between day and night are extreme, often reaching differences of up to 70 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric pressure on Mars is far below the Armstrong limit, the point at which humans cannot survive without a pressure suit. So for at least the first few years of any Mars mission, EVA suits will be a constant part of daily life. But even with all the challenges Mars presents, dust storms may be among the most dangerous and disruptive. Every year, large dust storms are observed sweeping across the Martian surface. These are the largest storms documented in our solar system and can cover entire continent-sized regions for several weeks at a time. The most extreme storms, those that envelop the entire planet, occur roughly once every three Martian years, blanketing Mars in a reddish haze that can last for months. These massive events not only reshape the Martian landscape, but also pose serious challenges to exploration and future human missions. Dust storms on Mars appear in various forms, from broad sweeping fronts to smaller swirling dust devils. These dust devils, rotating columns of air, are common on Mars and often serve as the spark for larger storms. While similar to those on Earth, Martian dust devils can grow significantly larger due to the planet's lower gravity and thinner atmosphere. Despite their intensity, Martian dust storms are unlikely to physically endanger astronauts or destroy major equipment. Wind speeds in the most powerful Martian storms reach around 60 miles per hour far below hurricane force winds on Earth, and the thin atmosphere means they exert much less force. So no, they probably wouldn't knock over a lander or strand an astronaut like in the movies. However, that doesn't mean they're harmless. Martian dust is composed of extremely fine, slightly electrostatic particles that cling to surfaces like styrofoam packing peanuts. This makes them especially problematic for solar panels. Even small dust devils can coat equipment in dust, reducing the efficiency of solar panels and lowering energy output. During global storms, the dust thrown into the atmosphere can significantly reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the Martian surface. This forces surface equipment to shut down or operate in low power mode until conditions improve. In some cases, systems must pause entirely to conserve battery life or protect sensitive instruments. So using a bunch of solar panel on Mars might not be the best long-term solution for powering a base. Nuclear power is often seen as the better option, especially for medium to long-term missions. Nuclear reactors produce steady heat, which can be turned into electricity using thermal engines or used in chemical reactions to make hydrogen. A lot of that heat, sometimes up to 90% in RTG systems or around 60% in more efficient reactors, doesn't get turned into electricity right away. But it doesn't go to waste. It can be stored in molten salt and used later 
or it can directly heat greenhouses and living spaces, or help with things like melting ice using rod wells or evaporating water. One big advantage of nuclear power is that it works no matter what the weather's doing, so it can keep a Mars base running reliably. Also, thorium, which is used in molten salt reactors, especially liquid fuel thorium reactors, is found on Mars in large but low-grade deposits, especially in the mid-latitudes. That makes it a promising fuel source for future Mars settlements. Now, if we ever plan to stay on Mars for the long haul, we'll eventually have to stop relying on food shipments from Earth and start growing our own crops on the Red Planet. I mean, how hard can it be, right? We've all seen movies where scientists grow potatoes in Martian soil like it's no big deal. Well, it turns out those movies leave out a lot. One major challenge is what's already in the Martian soil. When the Viking 1 and 2 spacecraft landed on Mars in 1976, they detected the presence of perchlorates. These chemicals were later confirmed by multiple missions, including the still-operating Curiosity rover. Perchlorates are a highly oxidized form of chlorine. On the one hand, they can be beneficial. Certain bacteria can use them as an energy source, and like regular salts, they can lower water's freezing point, helping liquid water to exist in Mars' otherwise harsh conditions. However, perchlorates can also be toxic to bacteria, especially when exposed to ultraviolet UV radiation. And guess what Mars is constantly bombarded with? Intense UV rays. Research published in 2017 showed that under simulated Martian UV radiation, perchlorates became significantly more lethal, killing even hardy bacterial spores within minutes. And it gets worse. Other chemicals in the Martian soil, like iron oxides and hydrogen peroxide, interact with these irradiated perchlorates to massively increase the kill rate, up to 10.8 times more deadly than UV exposure alone. Even common minerals like quartz and basalt, when abraded, contribute to the formation of reactive oxygen species, further adding to the toxicity. You might be wondering, how do perchlorates affect the human body? Well, they occur naturally on Earth too, forming in the atmosphere and the environment, but usually in small amounts. These trace levels, which can be found in our water and food, typically don't cause health problems. On Mars, however, we could be exposed to much higher concentrations of perchlorates. This is a concern because perchlorates interfere with the thyroid gland, disrupting the body's ability to absorb iodine. Over time, this can impair hormone production and lead to serious health issues, especially with long-term exposure. Fortunately, there is still hope. Researcher Kenda Lynch discovered the first known example of a habitat containing both perchlorates and perchlorate reducing bacteria in an earth-based analog environment, a paleo lake in Pilot Valley, located in the Great Salt Lake Desert of Utah, United States. She has been studying the biosignatures of these microbes and hopes that the Mars Perseverance rover will detect similar biosignatures at its exploration site in Jezero Crater. Despite the toxic chemicals present in Martian soil, growing crops on Mars is not entirely impossible. In fact, the soil on Mars does contain many of the essential nutrients plants need to grow, although this can vary depending on the specific location. Just like on Earth, where some areas have nutrient-poor soil and others are rich in nutrients, certain regions of Mars may be more suitable for agriculture than others. In 2016, researchers successfully grew tomatoes, radishes, peas, leeks, spinach, garden rocket, cress, quinoa, and chives in a simulated Martian soil here on Earth. The results were encouraging. Most crops produced only slightly less yield than they would have in regular Earth soil. While spinach struggled, the other plants grew relatively well. However, it is important to note that the test soil was enhanced with organic matter, something not readily available on Mars. Scientists are not only working to make Martian soil more suitable for growing crops, they are also taking things a step further by creating plants that are better adapted to grow on Mars. Imagine taking the cold tolerance of bacteria that thrive in Arctic ice, combining it with the ultraviolet resistance of tomato plants found high in the Andes Mountains, and merging both traits into an ordinary plant. What you get is a resilient, 
pioneer plant, capable of surviving in Martian soil. Much like customizing a car, NASA-funded scientists are designing plants to withstand Mars' harsh conditions. The goal is to engineer plants that can survive by incorporating traits from extremophiles, microscopic organisms that live in the most extreme environments on Earth. Using gene splicing, researchers remove beneficial genes from these extremophiles and insert them into plants to give them the ability to cope with cold, radiation, and poor soil. These genetically modified plants would likely be grown inside greenhouses on Martian bases. That's because no known life forms can survive direct exposure to Mars' surface, which is extremely cold, has a thin atmosphere, and is bombarded by sterilizing radiation. Although this research is promising, it pushes the boundaries of current science and technology. As a result, we are unlikely to see these engineered plants on Mars for at least another decade or more. It is important to note that just because there are a lot of challenges when it comes to going to Mars doesn't mean I think colonizing it is impossible. Sure, it might not be doable right now, but that doesn't mean it won't be in the future. What's important is that we have a clear plan and timeline. According to Elon Musk's latest update, SpaceX is aiming to land the first starships on Mars in 2026. These early missions will be uncrewed and focused on collecting data about how to land safely and operate on the Martian surface. If those go well, the next mission is planned for 2028. That one will also be uncrewed but it will start setting up the basic infrastructure needed to support future human missions. If everything works out, SpaceX hopes to send the first people to Mars as early as 2030. At first, we will be living in pressurized habitats, kind of like big space capsules with air pressure inside kept between 30 and 100 kilopascals. Anytime we go outside, we will need to wear full pressure suits. In the long run, the big dream is to terraform Mars, to make it more like Earth, so people can eventually live there without needing all that equipment. Elon Musk has a pretty extreme idea for jumpstarting life on Mars, on nuking it. As I mentioned earlier, Mars has an atmosphere about 100 times thinner than Earth's. Without a thermal blanket, it can't hold on to heat, and the average temperature is around minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 60 degrees Celsius. The idea is to drop nuclear bombs on Mars's polar ice caps. This would melt the ice and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, triggering a rapid greenhouse effect to warm the planet. It's a bold concept, but honestly, it feels a bit too extreme. A less intense alternative would be to release artificial gases that trap heat even better than carbon dioxide. The catch is that these gases don't last long, so we'd have to keep adding them to maintain the warming effect. But if we're talking about fully terraforming Mars, warming it up isn't enough. We'd also need to bring back its magnetic field, since we can't currently spin a planet's core to reactivate its magnetism. One possible idea is to place an artificial magnetic field between Mars and the Sun. This could, in theory, shield the planet from solar wind and help it hold on to its atmosphere. All of these ideas are still a long way off, but at the same time, I don't think Earth is going to face a catastrophic event that makes it uninhabitable anytime soon. So for now, we just keep moving forward, step by step.